I wonder what, my wife didn't come. She didn't, uh, now she has another meeting, but she's had to listen to me. Now, but thank you very much, Derek. And it's great to be included in this because many of the issues that you were bringing up today, it's almost like uh, things that we've been talking about the last 30 or 40 years. And in some ways, uh, the way you're implementing this may be a kind of a culmination in trying to bring together uh, a lot of these ideas and thoughts. And many of the thoughts that the working groups uh, came up with today, or workshops, or whatever they called it, are basically revisiting the things that uh, working with Everhard and Steve and Alina and all of my colleagues in geography and you students, and most uh, importantly, people in the villages, because the one thing that geography has done while I've been here is that probably one of the most important components of our course were our field trips. And our field trips where we actually go with the students and we stay in a village and we stay there for three or four days and the local men and women are the teachers on the reef, in the gardens, in the village, late at night over Kava Bowl. And, and this really uh, has been a foundation which is underlying what I feel is the success of many of our graduates at USP is that, that through their education they remain this critical link. And it was very interesting. You go into a Fijian village and one of your Indian students will come and say, that's wonderful. I grew up in Fiji, but that's the first time I've ever stayed in a Fijian village, you know? And, and, and then naturally, the, in many cases, in other Fijians, when they would go to the Fijian village on the west, they would actually get more of a buzz out of it than the Tongans and things. But uh, ne nevertheless, uh, it, that is a very important component. And I always like to tell a story where I was, people didn't think I was a serious academic. When I first got here, the, one of the first courses I was teaching was agriculture in the tropical world. Well, I went to a workshop in Hawaii, and that workshop was on food and nutrition for development. And it pointed out that, that rather than promote agriculture to export pawpaws and only the commercial crops that you were doing for export, is that agriculture should be the basis for food and nutrition and health, which came up in our working group and a number of other groups. And so, uh, so biodiversity conservation, which should be forests, agricultural areas, mangroves, reefs and everything, is really about food, livelihood and health security. Because we're really worried about sustainable human life and that stenius. So I came back and I changed the name of the course to agriculture, food, and nutrition in the developing world rather than tropical agriculture. And I actually had a module on breastfeeding. You know, we didn't do field work on that. But, uh, uh, but what I, I'm saying, so a lot of the things you're talking about, and then I was chairman of the F National Food and Nutrition Committee for seven and a half years. And the reason was Susan Parkinson, who some of you older group remember the mother of food and nutrition in the Pacific, she was the chairperson of the National Food and Nutrition Committee. I was a founder member. When she decided to retire, they said, Randy, you become chairman of the National Food and Nutrition Committee. Well, I don't know anything about nutrition. And they said, but no, you've been promoting a home food gardening program in the squatter settlements around here, and it's very successful, so you can do it. So I did. So I had to learn about food and nutrition. But it so what we're really talking about is holistic development. So if in your research projects, because it's pointed out in all of your objectives, that you want to link it to real development, development that helps the health of people, the environment. So if you keep that strand, whether it's marine research, whether it's research on agriculture, whether it's germplasm and things like that, there's always some element or aspect of that that you can share with local communities or learn from local communities. In fact, a lot of people in local communities would like to know about, uh, you know, gene sequencing and things like that. You know, you'd have to, it'd be kind of, I, 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 my Fujian and Tongan are pretty good, but I'd have a hard time explaining gene splicing and all this stuff. 
But this is supposed to be a research symposium, and so my title was Island and Ocean Life on the Front Line Against Negative uh, Global Change. And the reason I put negative global change is that there's some global change, hopefully this positive, so you just can't put uh, global change. And what are the challenges and opportunities for sustainable uh, sustainability research? Okay, I'm going to whiz through this very quickly. I'm going to take you for a magical mystery tour, poorly organized, of course, as Stephen knows. Uh, this was a talk that I gave uh, earlier this year, which Derek said after seeing it, he says, well, look, you just said everything. And what it was, the title was Nabuku Makawa Ke Navuli, and it was Ancient Wisdom and Modern Study, which is really combining science with with that, okay? And I was celebrating USP's role, uh, which is evidenced by many of you in doing that. Next. And what I'm telling you is really borrowed or stolen information. But it's information, and I've, in most cases, established pretty good relationships with these people, and, and it's enriched my life. And so it's been me and my students working with people throughout the Pacific. Next. And I'd like to, I thought I'd taken that slide out, but nevertheless, it's, I think it's very appropriate. Apelli Haofa was kind of brought about a synthesis on this, and one of the elements that's going to be part of the Ocean Hub is to look at the creativity and how you can link art and uh, performing arts and things, because one of our major challenges if we do research is not just putting it in a referee journal, but to put it in different forms, in languages, where the local people, your, the objects of study, have access to it. So, and Apelli was exemplary in this. Next. Okay, and USP has played an incredible role over the last 50 years, and it continues to do that. Why? Because of the incredible students we have, a number of dedicated staff we have, and the incredible island research uh, sites that we have. There's no place in the world, and I'm just going to very quickly, I'm talking to the converted, but some of you, even a guy from Tico Pia here, uh, hasn't, Lindsay, Lindsay, Lindley hasn't been to Tico Pia, his own island. But, so, uh, USP has played an incredible role. Next, please. Okay, what are we looking at? We're looking at, and one of the nice things about Solomon Islands, it's got high islands, it's got old, con almost continental islands, it's got some recent active volcanic islands, it's got raised limestone islands, it's got atolls. So you've got a whole range of different ecosystems where a lot of biogeographers say, okay, we'll go small island and things like this and we're gonna get drop off in the number of moths and birds. A lot of people have pointed out that in the Pacific Islands, it's the island type that controls the diversity. And so uh, we've got, you know, high Polynesian islands. Next, you've got raised limestone islands like Niue, Tonga Tapu Tonga, Uvea, New Caledonia, Bellona, where I was lucky enough to work with a lot of RX students and local community to see whether or not they had sustainable agriculture. 45 years after uh, Sophus Christiansen from Denmark did a study to this. So we went back and Sophus actually went back with us before he died. So you have this time depth research and involving the local students from Bologna, Melchior Mataki Mataki from uh, your cousin, from uh, your uncle or cousin? You know, so they're all Polynesian people speaking to each other. Next. And then we have the atolls. Clearly, the islands that are on the front line against a lot of global change, regardless of what the cause is, drought, uh, king tides, climate change, invasive species, land degradation, they are right there. So we need to look at this. Next, Kingdom of Tonga. Well, I was just gonna show, because some people haven't had a chance to go to these places. Okay, look, there, there's a glitch in that 
some. Okay, well, we've got incredible, we've got some of the most devastated landscapes that have actually, in, they've been mined to enrich the soils of Australia and to a lesser extent New Zealand. And, uh, and, but the people have this incredible culture, they've had incredible resilience, and uh, very important area for study. Next. Oh, just new way. This is after a very bad cyc tropical cyclone about uh, 10 years ago. That's, this, that's the bridal suite at the hotel there on the lower left. But new way, again, a raised limestone island. Next. Just, I have one of... Uh, can, can you stop on that? Samoa, raised, raised volcanic island, a recent island, uh, but suffering a lot of very, very serious problems, overfishing. Their entire, I'll tell you, go to the next slide, because we can't go through them. Vanuatu. I don't know what's, what? No, 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 I, w once you get past, okay, now, once you get past these ones of the, of the place, definitions is, should be okay now. Okay. Basically, and I think many of you have said that, Eurocentric development, purely urban-centric, urban foods, cash incomes, is not going to work for everybody. So we need some kind of balance. It's not sustainable in the long run. Next. And this is just a kind of a diagram that I've developed over the years to show you what the difference is. What, what you have is you have what we might call traditional livelihoods and the elements and the aspects of them, few invasive alien species, renewable energy resources rather than fossil fuel, very, very rich indigenous or local knowledge that was still intact. Uh, equitable sharing of resources, even the kings, they might have more land and a few more wives and yams and other people, but uh, there was basically ec equitable sharing. And, uh, and it was subsistence and not monetized. And then you move to the, to the purely modern sector, it's almost totally monetized. If you don't have any money, you're in trouble. And, but, and, and for, for about 50 years, we have promoted through our aid, through our education and everything is trying to get people to move from that traditional sector to the modern sector, to become modern. To become modern was good. Yet, as we know now, if everyone becomes modern, we're going to eat up all the islands, we're going to pollute all the islands. And, and so we need to, and I think, and I kind of con try to conceptually say what USP is about is producing graduates who mix modern science and their own traditional knowledge and languages so that they know how far to go along that line so they get the elements of both the traditional and the modern. So to me, that's, that's kind of a, a, an over-the-top thing, but I think that if we take that as a message and tell our students, you come here and you see this as a menu, but you you but you remember that if you really want to work in your own country and help that, you have to keep your own knowledge along with that. Next. Second, that our education system has really enhanced that. It's, it's, it's been culturally undemocratic. We've been imposing, you know, syllabi, exams, and everything from overseas not that that's not bad, but we need a lot more engagement of our own people in our education system. We need to bring in, and I think that's one thing that Steve and I and Everhart and people in geography have been doing is that's one way of allowing the men and women that have that knowledge to actually teach your subject to them in a very practical way. Next. Uh, the last thing is, I kind of poo-poo 
Uh, you might have seen my abstract. The, the, the problem is all the funders and all the researchers are making a lot of money and there's a thing on climate change, but in many cases they're not really saying what they mean by climate change. In some cases it's good because they're actually trying to stop coastal erosion, which may be caused by climate change, it may be caused by uh, a huge spring tide or something or a super moon. We don't know what the cause, but the main thing is, so what I'm saying is, regardless of what the problem is and the cause, the number one front line is to protect your biodiversity. And your biodiversity is all of your ecosystems, your reefs, your mangroves, your farmlands, your village uh, home gardens, and even your flower gardens and things, because that gives you things to protect all of those because if you get a drought and you have your diversity of food crops and some of them they're drought resistant, you're not gonna do it. But if you're an urban person and you no longer have a garden and you don't have the knowledge and you don't have any money, then it's finished. Next. So biodiversity is life, biodiversity is our life. And this was the theme of the year 2010, the year of biodiversity the UN Year of Biodiversity. Next. This is a reality. People in the Pacific Islands knew that biodiversity was their life. They'd known this for millennia. It's just that our modern education system and even science didn't really mix that message in with it. So even modern scientists, conservation, everything, a lot of Western conservationists, they're only worried about protecting those hot spots where they have endemics. They're not wor worried about working with gardeners and farmers and people to protect culturally and ecologically important plants and animals that may not be endemics, but they are threatened. Next. Okay, now, biodiversity. They did a survey in the United States and 60% of the people thought that biodiversity was a defer detergent. You know, so biodiversity is a fancy word, but it's so meaningful to people that live in biodiversity. It's all of the different kinds of ecosystems and islands that we talked about, from the large continental islands, continents, to the smallest atoll. All of the different kinds of vegetation, forests, grasslands, scrublands, whatever it is, garden lands, all of the different types of species and families and things like that. Genetic diversity. Look at this room. We're all the same species, aren't we? Right? But that's a, we usually talk about species, and species is, we, it, the, the definition I used, like to give to people is any group of similar organisms that normally, normally, can only breed or reproduce with their own kind, right? I mean, with, there are some people that act like jackasses, right? But, uh, but what I'm getting at normally, because we all know orchids and things like that, they can hybridize things, but normally, so it's a, it's a nice, it's a kind of a nice, nice definition. And then, whoop, now that's, that's what the, the Convention of Biodiversity, they, they define it down to genetic diversity because that's what they're worried about protecting. But for Pacific people, the last category is an integral part of biodiversity and that is all of their knowledge about it. Because, and that is diversity too, right? That's the missing link in the evolution of biodiversity conservation. Next. And that's the way I define ethnobiodiversity. Knowledge uses, beliefs, resource uses, conservation practice, taxonomies, languages, and education systems related to biodiversity. So that's the knowledge I think we're talking about. Next. This is a, I was asked to give a keynote at the launch of that year of biodiversity in Paris. And my topic was taxonomy and bioinformatics for all ages trying to be fancy. All ages, age-wise, but for the prehistoric age and the future, right? And taxonomy, I wanted to simplify it, meaning that people need to be able to identify something. If I know your name, 
I know you much better. I might protect you, right? But if I don't know you, who knows whether I'm even going to say hello. And so my subtitle was Name It or Lose It. So when I go to New Zealand to see my grandkids, my main job is to get them out of the house, away from their laptop computers or tablets or whatever they are, and I go out and I try to teach them to be new taxonomists. You know, I teach them the name of that tree and I teach them that. And, and if you do that, they begin to know. They begin to know the world around them. And our, I just, uh, Batiri, our daughter, just said, well, she was out the other day and she got, and little Tiare, our granddaughter, who's three and a half, she found a flower and she asked Tiri what it was and says, well, I'm not sure. And he says, geez, I can't wait to see Tutu. He'll tell me what that is, you know? So uh, that's my job. Next. Okay, now, everyone talks about what you need to do. If you protect the ecosystems, then you're going to protect everything, right? If you have a national park, you protect all the ecosystems. Well, that's true. If you protect the ecosystems, you'll protect all of that diversity. You'll protect the subsistence production, which is the main reason Pacific Islanders don't have the abject poverty that you have in areas where people are landless, don't have money. So if, if people lose their job and they keep their, their, their kin links and things like that, they're not going to die. They may not be, be able to go down and be at happy hour and have a drink with us, but okay. And then most of the production for sale in the Pacific, cash cropping, tourism depends a lot on the integrity of our ecosystems too, right? If it's a trash place, people aren't going to want to come here. So then export production is mainly that. Tourism is really a form of... Now, what, and then you have all of us urban guys who don't produce anything. I'm sure some of you do. Well, all of us are protected by the ecosystem. But then the way to protect those, which is more important, is the modern and traditional taxonomy. And that's where we come in. If we can marry the best modern science with the local science, then I think we can save and it can address many of these issues that you're talking about. Next. And this is just a way is how do you get sustainability? Trade would be represented by money. People need a little bit of money. Everyone needs to, but unfortunately, and unfortunately, uh, a lot of people, 50% of all their money goes to the church. And then, and then we find out when the marine protected area has been raided in the night and we get to the reason why it has been raided is because that village was the only one that hadn't, hadn't paid their required amount. So they went out and had to go fish and they ruined the, the MPA. So one of the things that we haven't heard any, well, we, this hasn't been on that, is we, in many of the conservation governments, one of the main partners has to be the church. They need to be involved in all this and they need to realize that they have a role to play in uh, research, conservation. And you had uh, Upolu here yesterday and he's one, he's a person who has brought together religion and let's, let's call his kind of religion modern religion or modern science religious or ecclesiastical science. And he is mixing it with the best traditional knowledge. And it's an extremely refreshing thing. And he's a real leader. Next. Okay, for Pacific people, you can't really separate the islands from the ocean. And I think this is a theme that is coming up uh, from that. They're interrelated. We don't need to go to all what all the links are. Next. And uh, on atolls, very, very clear how closely related the marine, the lagoon, and everything is. And these are, all, these are typically the islands where their crops are beginning to die, quote, because of climate change, although they don't tell you that, that on Funafuti and the main islands, they've overdrawn their water table by about 300% because of population. It goes down and then saltwater incursion comes in. So again, it's one plus one plus one equals minus six. Negative synergism. Next. And our coral reefs are among the most amazing in the world. Solomon Islands, one of your study sites, 
is considered to be in the, gold, in the coral triangle, which is the greatest coral and coral reef associated fish diversity on earth. So that's an excellent thing. But a lot of people are saying that Fiji is part of it. Fiji has the greatest diversity of actual different kind of coral reefs. Next. And they're all interlinked. And we're only beginning to find out, and this is an example where we mo marry the modern science with the traditional, in that we didn't really know much about the, the cycles of these fish until people were able to study these, these micro larvae. And so mainly the French scientists were doing this in French Polynesia and in New Caledonia. And uh, René Gazan was the one who let me steal this slide from him. Incredible research, but what happens is all, something like 90% of all the lagoon reef fish, they spawn and then the little eggs or, or very small larvae float out and they have an oceanic phase and they go out in the ocean and then depending upon the species, they come and they reinstall in the lagoon and then they eventually may go into the mangroves, the seagrass bed and grow a little bit bigger and then they go back to the reef. So we're beginning to understand that. And if we combine that knowledge with the knowledge local fishers have and women who go out on the reef, then we've got a very powerful thing. And it's been this kind of research which has empowered the success of uh, the locally managed marine areas network in Fiji, which is a great example of getting good modern science and mixing it with uh, traditional knowledge of the f women and men fishermen at the village. Okay, just, I want you to realize that we have incredible fish diversity here. In fact, I'm kind of going a little bit nuts. I don't, I think I'm going to die before I finish. Teddy Fong and I are trying to finish a book on the f fish of Fiji based on photos I've taken over the last 50 years. Next. Okay, just a little bit of history. We're not reinventing the wheel. The Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro, uh, was the one that really started, started this whole thing going. It was the United uh, Nations Conference on Environment and Development. And at that conference, next, they said the major obstacles, it was, they called, how many of you know about Agenda 21? Well, that was the major output that most people feel was the most relevant. But the, I simplified it, but the major issues were increasing population, which our group and many other groups brought up, Poverty and overconsumption linked together, and they, they are kind of two vicious heads. Next. Global climate change and variability, which continues to be a concern, although uh, this book that I'm going to lend to, to Gillian points out that the world's number one environmental problem by far is carbon pollution of the air. And it's not because of climate change, it's because it's killing millions and millions and millions of people, not to mention animals and things like that. And in the article in that book, it says, every year in China, 1.25 million people die directly due to cardiovascular pulmonary diseases related directly to this very small PM25, very small particle that they only could identify in the early 1990s that actually gets in people's lungs. And then he goes on to say, but China reports it a thousand times a day. They tell people to go inside. They tell them to put masks on. But in India, Pakistan, uh, Indonesia, they don't. And the pollution is worse there. And last week, if you watch TV, uh, they, they don't normally have much news when Trump isn't sending emails. There was like 20 minutes only about New Delhi and how people couldn't even go out and they're, and they're probably dying worse. So this doesn't downplay the fact we need to stop carbon emissions because it's, it's causing, it's a contributor to global warming. It just strengthens our case that the major thing we need to do is to stop emissions, right? Or have some way of controlling them. And then the loss of biodiversity, as I said, if you lose that, you lose the trees protecting your coast. You, you lose your plants to feed yourself. You lose your medicinal plant. You lose your construction materials, everything. So it's biodiversity protects us. Next. Okay, then the next World Summit, which was in Johannesburg, they changed the name from environment development to 
the summit on sustainable development because they realized Africa was a different place. Africa had abject poverty. You had people in slums. And they figured you just can't have the environmentalists talk about development and environment. You've got to really look at sustainable livelihoods for people. And that, that's the prime minister of Tuvalu uh, speaking. I was, uh, I was on the Tuvalu delegation. USP, we, we sent a team there, but we can't sit there. So we, different countries, adopt, put up with us and adopted us. So three, the three pillars of sustainable development then became environment, natural and cultural, economy, because people need some money, and then society, governance, and that. And many of these issues have all come up here. Next. And... The issue that really came up then, which is relevant to this forum, is the, the breakdown in the oceans. This was a significant change since the Rio summit. That we realized that the oceans were in much, much poorer health than we thought they were. A lot of people think, oh, you don't get extinction in the oceans. Uh, you don't have problems like you do with the, the one-eyed uh, owl that lives on top of the mountain and things like this. But we're now finding that the marine environment may be just as bad off in a different way. And that came up at the uh, Johannesburg meeting. And at the Johannesburg meeting, they, no, this was in Curitiba, Brazil, where the indigenous people are very important. They, they launched one of the major programs of the Convention on Biodiversity, and this is uh, an initiative on the involvement of indigenous people because they realized that they had much greater time depth knowledge of their environment and their biodiversity. And because this was the convention on biodiversity is that to be able to actually protect biodiversity depended upon our ability to engage the expertise, the knowledge and the communities of indigenous people. And islands are like arcs. Darwin was the first one to say that. In other words, they are arcs with limited number of plants and animals, and that if the population numbers go too low for one reason or the other, then we're going to begin to lose those things. And so we have to understand that islands are a little bit more complicated places. They have a limited passenger list. Next. And it, all of these theories of evolution and, and all this, no, no scientist ever came up with them until they saw islands because islands had these extraordinary organisms that had obviously, many of them evolved in place rapidly in isolation, but they were also realized they were more fragile because they had evolved in isolation from predators and diseases and things that are more common on the mainlands. Next. And uh, if you get a chance to go to... and the concept of a biodiversity hotspot. How many people could define a biodiversity hotspot? Lucky eddies, traps, oh no. A biodiversity hotspot is any place that has great biodiversity, in other words, many, many different species and taxa, very high levels of endemism, in other words, unique animals or plants that have evolved on that island, and that are threatened. So there's three elements to it, right? Hotspot meaning it's on fire, right? And so the Galapagos would be one. And I've had a chance to go there and it's pretty, pretty wild. Next. And here's an endemic from Taviuni. Taviuni is Fiji's garden island. But, uh, and so here's an endemic. These are the kind of things that we need to protect. And this is Konai, I mean, this is Tonga's queen. How many of you have heard of Heilala? Heilala is the national flower of Tonga, but it was introduced by the early Tong Polynesian settlers from Fiji. It's native to Fiji, but it's only found in gardens in Tonga. But it's really quite a, quite a unique. That's the, the fruit, and that's the thing. And it has a dioecious, it has separate male and female trees. And the Tongans know that. One's called Pulu and the other's called Hoko, I think. Next. Okay, at least 40% of all the coral reefs are in our area around our islands. So that's something that the Ocean Hub has to 
be proud of, but also take into account. We also have some of the greatest remaining rain for us. Where's Ka Katie? Is Katie still here? She's right back there. She's one of the Tetepari Landowner Association. This is supposed to be the biggest uninhabited island on the earth. We were talking about lunch. And so I was able to go there with David Bosetto and uh, Gunnar Keppel and uh, Patrick Picacha, some of the great emerging scientists of our time, of USP. So this is incredible. It's the largest uninhabited. It's been made a conservation area. Next. And as I said, this is the golden, this is the triangle of biodiversity, but it has extended now to include Palau and Solomon Islands. So, sorry about this old slide. The, I didn't want to make it a trape, trapezoid. Or a... Next. Okay, the western Solomon Islands is one of the most spectacular places in the world. They're very much like Tonga. Very funny looking women, right? But seriously, it is considered to be really one of the, the biodiversity hotspots on Earth. And so you're very lucky to have it as part of your study area to be able to work there. They have the, probably the highest language diversity, cultural diversity, and biodiversity in the entire Pacific Islands. So it's an incredible place. Next. But we also have the cool spots. And I, I coined this word. So rather than being high species diversity, high endemism and threatened, these have very, very limited the lowest species diversity on Earth. No endemism whatsoever on Earth, on, on land, but they are also very threatened. So the conservationists aren't worried about them because they don't have any sexy things like Heilala and Tungi Maudia. But for the people living on these atolls, that's the only biodiversity they have for sustainable living and sustaining their culture. Next, some of these islands are under threat and they're sinking, literally and figuratively. Next, the history of extinction. Something like 75% of all extinctions on Earth have happened on islands. Many of them, as I said, are on the front line against climate change. How many of you have been to Funafuti? Yep, even an old man like me, I can get from one side of the island to the other, one minute, you know? And I'll be sweating so much, I'll have to take a dip in the lagoon. These islands are also the first islands supposed to have climate change refugees. This is the island, this is part of Papua New Guinea, it's just north of the islands of Solomon Islands, exactly the same culture and everything, these atolls. But these people, many of them were located to Bougainville. Half of them went back to the island because they would rather be on their island with climate change and sea level rise and things like that, rather than being second class citizens in an urban slum in Bougainville. Now, what I'm getting at here is that, but now, John Connell, a geographer. How many of you know John Connell? Probably one of the best. No, John. He wrote a he wrote a paper in Pacific Viewpoint called "Migration, Population Growth, and Climate Change?" Question mark. And these people were the first climate change refugees because they showed that their taro gardens were being flooded and their coasts were eroded and things like that. So they were paid money to go to Bougainville. But then when, they, when he went to do his research, they had been doing that for 100 years. Why? Because every time there was a prolonged drought on the atolls, before they had boats and things like that, half the people would all die. So they had a strategy to go send people to the islands, whether it be to school or that. So they always tried to hedge their bets by getting there. So he's not saying that, he's just saying that these people on atolls People don't realize how tough atoll life is. They have the poorest soils in the world, virtually no water resources. If you have population increase or you have a prolonged drought, people die. The coconuts don't even produce. Okay, the people in the Pacific have an obligate dependence on their biodiversity. 
There's no other option. That's on Bologna. One of your Kenikarua. Next. Okay, what is our role? What is our role as researchers and scientists? Well, to do research that will provide and underpin sustainable development, ensuring sustainable island life. And so what I said in my title, what are some of the challenges and opportunities? What are some of the possible topics that we could research? And as I said, you could do it one, you could study the parasite on the back of a bumblebee, or you could look at a whole island or something. So scale is an issue, but in some cases, maybe we need to do things like traditional people do, where you aren't just a specialist on one, is maybe you're getting a little bit of information on a bunch of things. Next. So these are just some of what I feel are the major issues to sustainable island life. The first is intensification of the impacts of extreme events. And, the, and this was what I presented at the UNEP conference that we had at Oxford. Uh, as usual, and I'm going to brag on this one, uh, there were about 45 or 50 people, experts, going to that meeting. And they sent out a thing and they said they wanted all of us to put what we thought were the 10 most serious either new emerging or intensifying threats to biodiversity. So I did mine, and they said, if you want to do more than 10, you can do it. So I, I think I did 13, because that was my lucky number. I used to, that used to be my number in football. But uh, so I sent them in, and I get there, and there were only about three of us that had actually done our homework and sent the bloody things in. But that's good because my, mine and these other guys became, became the document, right? The other guys hadn't thought. So intensification, and what I said here is, we can't prove whether that drought is due to human-induced climate change, El Nino, moon, sunspot, or whatever it is, but we do know is wherever we go, the impact of drought, tropical cyclones, king tides is worse. And that's what we've got to address. We've got to build resilience to that. And that. Secondly, invasive alien species. Ants alone may be a worse threat than climate change. How many of you have problems with ants at your house? How many of you have problems with ants in your pants? My mom always said I had ants in my pants. She doesn't know. She hasn't seen this white-footed ant here that has alliances with 25 different parasites, sap sicking Sap sucking insects. I would. I. I was saying. Are any of you guys uh, economists that could help me figure out what the loss of citrus trees and citrus production is because of those in Fiji? I mean, it must be in the tens of millions of dollars. But no one worries about it because it's not export. You know what I'm talking about? These mealy bugs. Overfishing of inshore waters. An extremely serious problem. Coastal littoral, go down. Go to the next slide because I'm going to look in just with a tiny bit of detail what they are so you see. Okay, intensification, I think I've already gone over this, tsunamis and things like that. We had a tsunami in the, in the uh, late last century, in, I mean the previous century in Samoa. Exactly the same magnitude, exactly the same area, no deaths, very little damage. But then... In 2009, when Everhard and I went there to do the uh, post-survey work, you had a lot of deaths, you had destruction and everything. Well, the environment had changed. You had tourist resorts out in a zone where people, traditional Samoans would have never put them. And you had a whole range of things. So definitely things are happening. We have greater populations. They are settled in wrong places. You probably have an increasing poverty. If you had this last Hurricane Winston and it hit any of the squatter settlements where construction standards are bad, we would have had very, very serious uh, casualties from that, right? But uh, these extreme events have always been a reality. Uh, whether they are intensifying or not, that's still out to the jury. But the one thing we do know is the negative impacts are worse. Next. I think I've... It's just, next. 
Okay, this is just to show you the trees in the aftermath of the tsunami in Samoa. You had the dilo or the ironwood tree, coconuts. The people that had planted those received less damage. They were told by their grandfathers, don't cut those down or told them to plant them. So, and as Everhart will tell you, there were some areas totally devastated, but where people had kept their trees, it had minimized the, the devastation. And this is going back, I went back uh, three years later, still no coral recruitment whatsoever. So we don't know the impact of these extreme events on things like coral reefs, right? Next, invasive species, they are, they're serious. I really, I mean, we've got a measles epidemic in Samoa. That's an invasive alien species, right? In fact, measles, influenza, tuberculosis, and that killed, killed over half of the populations on some of the Pacific Islands. Populations of people that evolved their own languages and things in isolation from European and Asian continental diseases. So they get to these places. A mongoose gets here. None of our birds have ever seen a mongoose. They don't have it in their DNA or their, their nurturing to deal with it. So they become extinct. Next, just a list of some of these buggers that are coming in here. Mammals, all these different mammals on different islands of the Pacific. Birds, reptiles, brown tree snake in Guam, the highest density of snakes anywhere on Earth. There's virtually no endemic birds, ground tree birds or ground birds left on the island. Invasive species. Yeah, the, and uh, Anton New York was doing studies in Tuvalu. You have this invasive seaweed that came in from outside Tuvalu and it's taking over their local, their local bay. And this is an incredible, I got this. This is taking over the, the east coast, the northeast coast of the island of Japan. This is a, a huge jellyfish and that, that shows you, that's a true picture on how big it is compared to a diver. And that's what the fishing nets look like. They, the fishermen were getting no fish whatsoever. All they were getting get these jellyfish. And the Chinese know how to eat them, but, they, but the Japanese don't want to eat this thing. You know? It looks more like an ice cream cone, doesn't it? Okay. Overfishing is really a serious problem, and it's been for a long time. Next. Uh, the top marine scientist who won the Darwin Award a couple years ago, Jeremy Jackson, said that overfishing is by far the most serious threat to the near shore coral reef ecosystem, above climate change, above pollution, above degradation. Overfishing, because you break down all of these trophic uh, and food uh, relationships. And you get trophic cascades where it just kind of goes right down the thing. And this to show you a study, as I said, Fiji's near shore fisheries, because of promotion by the by the fisheries department, giving people boats and everything and promoting commercial fishing starting in the 1960s, by the early 70s, you began to get a whole bunch of shellfish and things that were selling at the market, cowries and everything, that were totally disappearing. And it wasn't until the locally managed marine areas network get in, and uh, I think we'd pay a silent tribute to Bill Albersberg and some of the people who were really behind that, is that all of a sudden, people began to see. Kids were seeing things they'd never seen before. The older, the older women and men were the only ones that even knew the name of them because they hadn't seen them. Name it, lose it. Well, if you've lost it, you can't name it, right? But we did studies, and we found something like 827 different species, which had either been seen for the first time in over 25 years, were clearly increasing, uh, yeah, so I'm just saying that these, I want, I'm using this as an example of where we can take good scientific study along with the traditional knowledge because you're not going to be able to go out and do a study today and find out what to read. Jeremy Jackson is one of the people responsible for the thing of the imaginary baseline where you get a fancy marine scientist who will go out and say, well, this is the state of the lagoon and we're going to do marine protection and then we're going to come back two years later and tell you how it's improved. What Jackson's saying is, hey man, the improvement will be even more spectacular if, 
if you, if you began to know what was really there rather than this imaginary baseline. Next. De coastal de deforestation and degradation. Our man everyone's worried about mangroves, and they're serious, but even more serious than mangroves are our coastal littoral forests, which are the forests that grow along the beach line, and they're also the forest on the inner margin of the mangroves. And these are our first line of defense against heavy waves, against coastal and sand erosion, and things like that. So rather than only playing mangroves, we really need to protect. And remember, conservation is an easier option than restoration or enrichment. In other words, to go out, feel good, and get t-shirts and plant mangroves and hope that they represent what nature did is a much harder thing. It's much easier to protect a forest rather than try to recreate a forest. They're far more threatened than mangroves. These are, and every one of them has a name and has a use. Next, we did a study, I did a study of 140 common coastal littoral plants, trees, shrubs, and vines, and of 140 40 plants, uh, there was 100, 125 uses for coconut alone, 1,024 different use categories. Medicine was only one use category. And so I just want you to look at that. That's ecosystem services. That's value. But for people on atolls or people on the outer islands of Fiji or Solomon Islands, which you, some of you are going to work with, they, they don't have any chemists or pharmacies. And they, there are some things that they're going to have to go to the hospital for, but a great number of things they can treat using these medicines. So why am I putting this up there? Why am I bogging you down with this detail? Well, because the detail really gives us some insight as to why we want these studies to protection and why it is so important to have our studies combined with local knowledge of what has happened. Next, this just gives you an idea of some of the uses, starting with the one that was the most common for those 140 species, medicine, general construction, body ornamentation. Are you worried about body ornamentation? That's a nice shirt. What necklace are you wearing today, everyone? Ear, what earrings do you? What I'm getting at is a lot of our fancy wealthy people will spend $5,000 for a diamond ring or something like that. Whereas on the islands, people make these incredible garlands, but we're losing this. They don't, they don't. I don't need a diamond ring. I don't have no Cadillac car. Can't remember what's that song. Okay, you can look at that. This is going to be available to you anyway. Next. Okay, as I said, we also have the cool spots. These are islands that have no endemics on land. Very, very little diversity. This island only has 42 indigenous species on the whole island. And those are all those coastal plants. No mangroves even, even there on Aranuka. Next. Okay. So most global conservation wants to work on the big islands like Solomon Islands and Fiji. They're not worried about the poor atolls. Next. But some of the atolls are some of the most amazingly threatened areas in incredible places. This is Christmas Atoll. When we went there for the first time in uh, 1996, there was nine million seabirds. When we went back 10 years later, it was down to 1.5, climate change. No, they had a very, very prolonged drought. And just like the atoll dwellers, humans, a lot of them died. But they also resettled a whole bunch of kiripas there. And it's a very dry island. It's in the dry climate area. And the people didn't have any money. And they've always, as Rotumans have done, and Bonobans and everything, they love seabirds. It was like Kentucky Fried Chicken. So they were just eating seabirds, man. Really, how many people have eaten a booby? Well, they're good. Okay, but that's what happened. So in 10 years, it went from 
what, 9.5 9 million to 1.5 million birds. Uh, I'm running out of time. What? Keep going? Okay. Leave if you want. I need a drink of water. Derek knew. I said when, when I asked. <laughs> that is the most important ecosystem service. Okay, agro deforestation. We always talk about deforestation and that. But in the, in the late, in the early 90s, Bill Clark and I wrote a book called Agro, Pacific Island Agroforestry, Systems for Sustainability. And I, I started thinking, I said, well, if we have deforestation, what about agro deforestation? Meaning, because we were talking about agroforestry, which means that they must be agricultural forests. And so I coined this term agro deforestation. And I think it, like for atolls and places like that, like that, those atolls we see, they don't have virtually no native forest. All they have is agroforest. Most of them have been coconut, but around villages, you may have uh, breadfruit trees with taro gardens underneath and maybe banana trees and bundi trees and things like that. So this is, but agro deforestation, a very serious thing. And on some of the smaller islands, there are no, virtually no native forest. Maybe a little coastal and mangrove, that's all. Next. And I think I just said that. These are the, and these are the remaining sources of medicines and all those things that I, that I mentioned, these agroforests. So a lot of people would go in and they had a big project. We got funded to do the book on agroforestry. We had a study where Bill and I went to Vanuatu and, and did studies on trees and agricultural systems in Vanuatu. And it's amazing. The value of those trees, and that's a traditional system, whereas you got FAO, they come in, oh, we're, gonna put, we're gonna support, we're gonna promote agroforestry, we're gonna bring you rubber trees and we're gonna plant them there and then we're gonna do kava in between this fancy idea. Well, that's fine, but Pacific Islanders already had uh, agroforestry systems. Maybe they might have a tree or two that's new that they might, and Pacific Island agroforesters and gardeners if you, how many of you are gardeners? Us gardeners, we will, if someone's got a new plant, we will always try it, won't we? We want to integrate it in there. We want to be the first one on the block to have the new plant, right? And Pacific Island people have been doing that for years. Papaya, pineapple, manioc, cassava, soursop, all these, these are all non-Pacific, non non-Polynesian, crops. They've all been, and they've said, hey, that, that's quite, that might be good in my garden. Next. Okay. One of the greatest ever assessments is what's called this, how many of you have heard of Sato Yama, Sato Umi? Okay, well, back in the 2000s or something, they had what they call the Millennium Assessment of Ecosystems. Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. And the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment went to mangroves to try to look at the status of mangroves. Look at the status of tropical rainforest. Look at the status of dry forests. Look at the status of all that. And the Japanese said, hi, hi, you know, arigato gozaimasu. But 600 years ago, we deforested almost all of our islands. And all of our forests in Japan are basically human made forests. Most of them are agroforests. And so they said, we don't want to do your millennium. We are going to do the Sato Yami, Sato Umi assessment. And this is very nice for this, for your topic, because Sato Yama is the traditional village and rural land agricultural landscape, right? Sato Umi is the traditional highly managed near shore marine area where they, they started pearl culture long before. They had oyster farming. The Japanese are amazing. So they said, we are going to assess the status of that. And when they did it, 
they put out this assessment. And you can download it. You can Google it. It's a beautiful thing. And they pointed out invasive alien species are a serious problem. But they're mostly, a, they're more of a problem in the Satoyama, Sato Umi than they are in the native things, right? But I just, this is an interesting example. So some of you, as part of this project, you might want to do, because Satoyama and Satoyumi is exactly what they do in Fiji and the Tonga and everything else. It's just that the Japanese is being very culturally embedded. Next. Oh, they just, they have a lot of nice things. They had units and schools and everything. It, it was really nice. And we've got the same thing in Fiji, Fiji Tonga, uh, everywhere. Pandas, some people... A lot, how, many of you, how many of you would have identified that as pandanus? How many of you wouldn't have? Well, that's the number one, probably the number one woman's crop in Fiji. It's probably the third or fourth most important economic crop for making baskets and weaves and thatching and, and hats and everything like that. But it's usually planted along the margins of mangroves and other places like that. And the women go out, it's a very sustainable thing. So I'm just saying that we got to put a human face on these different little bits of landscape, which most of us kind of drive from here to Nandi and we just see them as green. Okay, food, of course, man. This is in, uh, uh, I think that was taken in Tokelau. Ooh. What happens if you don't have your fish anymore? All the kusikusimas will be sad, right? All the umisis in Tonga and the mataais from Samoa, right? What's the Tuvalu one for someone who craves fish? I can't remember. Umisi, same as Tonga. You're not from Nanumea or Nanuma. Next. Okay, now... In terms of our management, and this is almost like this, uh, the ridge to reef started with the uh, uh, Dieter Mueller Dumbwa. Some of you knew him. He's worked with USP. We worked on, on what they call the uh, Pabitra Network, the Pacific Biodiversity Conservation Transect, which went from Malaysia all the way out to the smaller atolls. We had sites to compare them. But it was basically trying to promote, it's okay to have gardens and things like that as long as they're integrated into the forest. Next. This is a woman's garden in Palau. And there were 28 different species of food plants in that one picture. And this is the women. The men do the fishing. The women are the taro gardeners there. I mean, since, since you're not teaching, I'm going to tell you this story. Uh, the Australians funded a big project to try to introduce some new sweet potato varieties in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. So they bred all these things. And they went up and they did all these workshops and they, they had workshops like us and they had the people doing that. And then they went back a year later and there wasn't a single sweet potato planted. You, you, you want to know why? Well, the workshops they held with men, and the men don't plant sweet potatoes <laughs> in pop, right? You try to have a taro planting workshop with the, with the men of Palau, they'll nod, and then they'll go fishing at 2 o'clock. Okay, again, it's, I think, one of the most beautiful landscapes in the world, because I'm interested in landscapes, is the cane belt. The Fiji cane belt used to be about 40,000 different cane farms. And if you go on to there, well, I went and did a survey of there, and I think there was 52 different kinds of useful trees. Sacred trees, medicinal trees, trees for garlands, trees for puja, and things like that. So I want you to look at that, and I want you to see a research opportunity. Imam Ali, who uh, did his master's with me looking at the diversity of food crops on cane farms in the, the Tavua area. He's gone on to do a PhD and he's run away to Australia. Next. Okay, food security. We talked about that in our group today. On the atolls, you can't grow much. 
So they've developed a very intensive mulching system where they have trees that they know make the best fertilizer and they've they take the trees from Ili the leaves from Elima and they put them in the sun because if you put them on the plant too early, it'll burn the plant. The other leaves, breadfruit leaves, they mix them in fertilizer because the soils are so poor. So they developed this, this thing that's called pulaka there. It's the only root crop that grows on atolls, although giant tar will grow a little bit, regular tar will grow too. She's a, she's a famous pulaka farmer. Right? Next. Okay. That's a famous farmer on the lower right there. Okay. Manongi. In Tonga, there's also a special word, alaha. Alaha is the special word for the fragrance of flowers wafting. Because in the big five, you've heard of the big five, right? The lion, the elephant. Well, the big five in the Pacific where they have no land mammals are all flowers, right? So we've got to protect the big five. The whole study in itself, fragrant, sacred flat. Next, okay, taro. How many people have had taro? Dalo. Well, in 1993, taro leaf plight struck Samoa and wiped out all of their taro. It was their major export crop. It was their major local cash crop. It was their major staple food. It was their major green vegetable, just like row, row, right? Luau, they call it. And it's been 20 years now, and they're just beginning to get a hybrid. The hybrids are beginning to come back. But I, to my last knowledge, they hadn't been able to establish. So here is an invasive species that's totally wiped out, you know, would have... Wiped out a quarter of their economy, probably. Loss of tropical montane cloud forests. How many people have heard of this? We've all heard of the glaciers, haven't we? Well, this is the tropical equivalent of losing your glaciers. Because cloud forest comes down where you have the dew line, right? Where clouds hang around. And if we get increasing temperatures, that dew line goes up. But the dew line doesn't go, it doesn't go up proportionally because it's a cone. What is it? High is 3.14161272. So it goes equivalent. So if you've got this much cloud forest and it, and it goes up by half, you probably cut your cloud forest in half by a third or something like that. I don't know what, are you with me? But that cloud forest is important because it sequesters water from the cloud. The water condenses on the leaves, it goes down the stem, it goes down to the roots, and it slowly goes out into the water table and it's distributed throughout the year. And when you look at the amount of water coming down streams in, in a healthy area of each label, it's something, I can't remember the exact amount, something like twice the amount of what you would expect from the rainfall that came during that period. And it's because the cloud forest acts like this sponge that just sucks moisture out of the air. So if we do get increase in temperature by two degrees, there are going to be some mountaintops that will no longer have cloud forests, and others, the area of it will have reduced. And this will have a major impact on the hydrological uh, regimes of the country. And tropical moist forests are very important because on tropical islands they're found lower than they are on continents because of what they call the mess and boom, bang wound. Uh, Everhart could pronounce it, it's a German word. But how many of you have been to Mount Tomanevi? Any of you? Seru, you came with me in my class, right? Oh, he may have led the expedition. Did you go, Elena? Oh, yeah. But uh, you're, you guys are from Fiji. You've never been there. It is one of the most magnificent trips. Did you go? Really? Wow. Amazing. I couldn't go there anymore with a fake hip and brain. Okay, break down in the biogenic calcium budget. Fancy words, huh? Okay, let's make it the 
the sand and sediment budget. Now, what happens is you ask someone like out on, in both in Tuvalu and both out here at Makaluva Island. I talked to some of the older people. All the beaches were going. And I asked them, when did that happen? And they said, Hurricane BB 1971 or 72. That's when we lost the beach. The problem is, since I have a captive audience, I want to share some fun. I used to go body surfing almost every weekend during the summer in California. And during Christmas, all our, my mates, during Christmas we, we thought, saw a sale at a skin diving store, so we thought we'd go in to buy Christmas presents. But instead of buying Christmas presents for our family, we bought wetsuits for ourselves. And we said, well, let's go down to Santa Cruz body surfing in wetsuits. So we got our wetsuits, got in the car, drove down there. So we potty surfed. But the beach was different. And so we came out and we said to the guy, we said, hey, uh, what, what, what happened to the beach? And he said, you guys aren't locals, are you? <clears throat> you guys are from out of town. I said, yeah, and he says, it's always like that during the winter. Because during the winter, we have heavy storm waves, and it comes, and it scours the beach out, and it takes it out because of heavy storm action, just like it happens when you have storm waves in the Pacific. But because you have a sand budget that's based on the minerals from the mountain coming down, every calm season, the beach is replaced. In fact, it may even be replaced more now that we have uphill erosion. But in the Pacific and on atolls, you go to Funafuti, 70% of the sand comes from foraminiferous uh, forams, or halamida, marine organisms. So if because of pollution or other factors, whether it could be increasing climate, you have a decreased production of these organisms that provide the sand, when you get a hurricane and it, and it takes it away, you're not going to have the sand source to bring it back. So, it's, so to me, this and the decline in the, the retreat of the cloud forest may be two very significant things that may be related to increasing uh, ocean temperatures, right? Okay, this is what Tepuka Funafuti Island looks like. Everywhere you go in Tuvalu, this is happening. The beaches are eroding. But they also, and I showed you the invasive species, we don't know to what extent the sand budget has been goofed up. Coral disease and the death of coral, and this is a major serious problem, as we said. <clears throat> I showed you what happened after the tsunami in Samoa, going back three years later. No recruitment whatsoever, and we kind of have this vision that there's all of these reproductive coral organisms all swimming over, ready to recolonize any reef. But uh, it's much more complicated than we think. But increasing sea temperature certainly will is a major factor on this. And coral disease. The main reason for the death of coral reef is coral disease. And they're even getting it in the Western Solomon Islands. So that may be a really good research project for someone, if you have someone with that expertise, is to look at the coral disease. Because in the Caribbean, it wiped out 90% of all of the uh, a cropper of corals. I think it was a cropper of corals, the main, the main coral. So we always think of all these things, but disease, but coral disease is an invasive alien organism. They did a study in Hawaii at the military base, and they poured out the bilge water of a boat, a uh, military boat, and there was something like 79 foreign organisms that were still alive floating around in the ballast water. So marine invasive species is a very interesting and serious issue, but we don't know much about it. I always ask my class, how many of you swim? Only half of them put their hands up. How many of you ever had a snorkel on? Maybe a quarter. 
How many of you ever had a scoop? scuba? Maybe three or four, and they might be the exchange student. So what I'm getting at is, because we are basically land lovers, we don't know as much about the marine environment as we do about the land environment, except if you're with this fish here, Gilead. Next. Okay, coral disease, I said Merobo gets in the Western Solomons now, which is considered to be part of the Coral Triangle. Next. And the final one, which I think is underlies everything, and that is the loss of knowledge about biodiversity. And if we lose that, we may lose the battle to protect it. No name, name, name it or lose it, right? Okay, this is something Pacific Islanders always knew because they co-evolved with these plants and animals. Uh, now we're learning more about E things than we are about uh, the uh, living things, the B things, the biodiversity things. So uh, I think that that's another challenge we have. As many of you know, and many of you probably are like me going crazy over it, is you can learn anything about biodiversity you want. You can write a paper almost on any organism or anything, or its ethnobiology, because of the internet. It's an incredibly powerful, almost mesmerizing, but if you're doing it for games and stuff like that, it can't, but I mean, it's incredible. But if we combine that ability to do that with field work and actually seeing them, and we also, allow local people to teach them how to, to kind of look up the plants and animals and things like that and fish. So, uh, although I kind of poo-poo it here, man, I just don't know what I'd do without the internet now, you know? People say, well, why don't I see in your office? I say, well, because I've got all my resource books at home and I'm, I can just Google anything I want. Next. Okay. The whole con we have concepts of biodiversity which are all inclusive in all of our languages. Fonua, Fenua, Enua, whatever you want, Teaba. And, and it's not just land. It is the ancestors, it is the names of the plants, it's their yam gardens and everything. And there's, I recommend a book to you. There's a book, it's called Kanak Witness. Cannot witness to the world. It's an autobiography of Jean-Marie G. Bao. It's written, it's written by Eric Waddell. Some of you might remember was professor of geography here, who did his PhD in Papua New Guinea. It's a wonderful book, but it's about G. Bao, who some people will argue you say is like the Nelson Mandela of uh, of the Pacific. He was a Kanak leader who who lost his aunt and stuff, shot by the people that, and the the Canucks of New Caledonia have a history very much like the American Indians and the Australian Aboriginals. Uh, they really had their lands taken away, they had everything taken away, they were murdered. It, but th this book is really pretty amazing. Thanks. Okay, reason, why are all these things happening? Well, it's all like negative feedism, feeding. Maybe changing temperature may be the main driver in one thing. On the other one, it may be overfishing. On the other one, it may be overuse or deforestation or medicinal plant. The point is, we got to find out what the issues are and then dedicate our research, working with local people to get their thing, and then suggest an action. And as I said, if we can link all of our projects both to, and in some cases, you're going to be in a quite a special area, so there's not going to be a lot of local knowledge about it, but that doesn't mean you can't share your knowledge of that so that they, they begin to know uh, some of the science. And I think this has been the exciting thing with me working with Asakai Balawa for 25 years and other people here is I share my knowledge with them and they share their knowledge with them. And they become scientists in their own right that, that kind of see their own environment from an enriched perspective also. Okay, I'm just going to go, importance, we had a workshop and we, to preserve all the names of the fish and everything in Tuvalu, and we published that. Next. Uh, as I said, all of, because of the changing population, aspirations, and, 
and the heavily threats to the environment. Modern Western science alone is not enough, nor is traditional indigenous and local knowledge. We must build strong synergies between them. It's not about recognizing each other, it's about combining them in a synergistic way. And uh, next. And so these are just some of the areas where we could do it. And I put them up here from a kind of a sectoral standpoint because whether we like it or not, many of our countries work that way. Forest, forest and forestry, whether they be mangrove forest, inland forest or anything, is a real area where we can combine local traditional knowledge. Marine resource management, the locally managed marine area is good at that. Environmental change and extreme events. How do people deal with these events? How, what help do they need from outside from modern science? Because they tend to be worse. Uh, watershed management, water management is critical, particularly on atolls. There's no surface water on atolls. All their water is in the form of rainwater catchments on their roof or a freshwater lens, which is very fragile. Uh, soil and feed rate management. I put those together, right? Because everyone burns and things like that, but fire is a real problem. Fire can be beneficial in some ways, but so soil and fire management is another very important area. Most traditional farmers in the Pacific will cut their bush, let it dry out, burn it, it will provide nutrients, but it, but it also causes other things. And then agriculture and food systems, and in our group, and I think the other groups we really pointed out, we really need to look at food, nutrition, and health together as a holistic entity rather than things alone. Next. Medicine and health. I think go together pretty well. We can put food there too. Handicraft and construction, very important. How do, you, how do you build canoes or boats? Or how do you build a house that is hurricane or probable cyclone proof? There's probably a lot we can learn both from modern construction and traditional construction. Invasive alien species management and disease management, very serious problem. Energy and waste, how do we deal with that? Everyone talks about we need to worry, but let's go have, let's go get t-shirts and pick up plastic. Well, that's not the problem. How many times have you seen people in the last 20 years going and picking up rubbish and cleaning the mangroves and having a t-shirt and then going and having a barbecue afterwards, but the government has not had any enforceable legislation or anything or any campaign to raise awareness on why we should be like the Japanese. I'm going to tell you a story about Japanese. The Japanese hosted the World Cup in soccer, right? The Japanese, if you've ever been to Japan, they don't, it's hard to find a, a way to incinerate, hard to find a waste basket, but there's no waste anywhere. So after the, after the game finished, and the, all the Japanese fans got up and they left the stadium, there wasn't a single gum wrapper or cigarette thing or anything there, and then all the Aussies and New Zealanders and Brits and Fijians and everyone got up and there was just shit everywhere. It was a rubbish bin. Why? Because they don't, they, they have a, we have a rubbish culture in Fiji. We do. You just see, I don't know how many times a week I scream out at someone who's throwing something out. But, you know, Frank will pay $10,000 to have a billboard made, but there's no law. It isn't good enough just to go on TV and say, "Be a, do it the right way. Uh, give someone back their rubbish, don't steal it. So, it was the right thing to do. Okay, tourism and recreation and sports. Another amazing area, right? Next, social guide. Okay, I'm just going to run through some examples of these marriages. The Loyalty Islands, working with the... Uh, University of New Caledonia with the IRB, with students from there, our students, Penny Fong, Aquila Bakabaka, Barabi, our son. We worked with a French team and we did surveys of the biodiversity there and we worked, talked with the local community and they agreed they needed to protect it and it became part of the New Caledonia World Heritage Site. 
You've got uh, Joni New Kula and many of our graduates here working with the National Trust. They've established the Iguana Sanctuary and a captive be breeding program on these animals, which is an endemic species. This is Tetepari Island, where Kate comes from, with Patrick Picacha, David Bosetto, who, who I think are two of the best scientists in the entire Pacific. And as I said uh, this morning, Patrick Picacha is, in my mind, uh, since Patty Ryan lives in Colorado, I think Patrick's the best wildlife and nature photographer in the entire Pacific right now. Can you think of anyone better? And he's published. Conservation and shark dive operations. Now some people say, oh, you shouldn't bother sharks. Well, at least it's brought, uh, brought an awareness, it's protected them because sharks were really, really, they still are very, very overfished, particularly some species. And it's by these long line fishing boats, when they're not out fishing on the deep, you see them cruising along outside of the reef down near Navakabu and Nandronga, right? The Great Sea Reef is part of a protected area, and working with the, the Tui Madawata, the, the, the head of the chief, Isaiah Kataniverre, uh, they designated this as one of a marine reef. This is the third longest barrier reef in the world after the Great Barrier Reef and the New Caledonia Barrier Reef, although the people in Belize say they have the third longest, but we'll, we'll give them third equal. Okay, this is Dakao Lebo, and that's. Uh, Asakaya Balawa, who along with our students would go and be part of these community consultations to work with that. Can you go? Okay, now islands, islands are kind of, one, one thing that we're lucky about, we're lucky, islands, because they're limited, they can be laboratories. So in your projects in the Solomon Islands and Fiji, you may want to choose some coastal areas, maybe some islands, as integral reach to reach units to actually uh, do some of your projects. And so U USP has been recognized as a center of excellence on sustainable development. Okay? Uh, we, we had an Econesian society. They've kind of gone silent lately, but they were very active for a while, trying to do projects, awareness raising projects uh, throughout uh, Fiji. Singatoka Sand Dunes, the first national park. Our students, working with Dick Watling and a number of others in local villages, declared and it's still Fiji's only national park. Uh, next, I think I had that one. I think you're going backwards. Okay, the Asia Pacific Marine Areas Learning Network. Uh, we have something, what is it? Is it 300 marine protected areas now or something? Anyone here from Plema? No one here from Plum, and then we'll say five minutes. So, but uh, it's really the most successful uh, kind of uh, managed uh, conservation network many people think in the world. And because it was so successful, it is spread, and it's now in Madagascar, and it's, and it's a world movement. Uh, this is working with our people on the island of Bellona. We went there to do a, a scientific research with in the upper right hand corner is Sopus Christiansen. He did work in the 1950s, no, 1960s. He looked at the sustainability of biodiversity and the list of fish, plants, and everything. And then we went back 50 years later. He was part of the expedition, taking our USP students. You can see some of your mates there. And uh, we did a resurvey of it. It was part of a project to compare Tikopia, Anton Java, and Bellona, which were all things that had been studied about 50 years ago. So this may be something you may want to look at in, the, in your study. Is look at Tikopia is in the Solomon Islands, Bellona is in the Solomon Islands, so is Anton Java. So if you have a comparative research project, you may want to think, well, if any of you have an expertise that would be good to fit into that, at least you would have pre-existing data on that. Uh, you can talk to the boss of label here and tell you where. Okay, then you have Gerald McCormick. How many of you know about this? Well, the Cook Islands is extremely fortunate. They've got Gerald McCormick there, 
who has actually established a database that is based with the Bishop Museum, and he's chronicled every living plant and animal, local names and everything. So the only country in the Pacific that has a biodiversity database is the Cook Islands, and it's due to uh, Gerald McCormick. And uh, many of you, I think some of you, this this whole initiative here, and was Edward working with you on this? Not, but he was before, or not? Okay. Well, I don't, I don't know. But he is uh, worked with Joel Greenock and a number of other people on combined projects. But he's produced some of the really uh, valuable stuff from the Western Solomon Islands, where he's actually produced the material in the local dialect. And this is another area of opportunity that when you when you write your individual research projects in terms of output, think of some simple guides on different things, whether whether it's soils or the fish or the plants or anything like that, because a lot of these places the names have never been written down. And so a simple guide, even, a, even if you only take the top 30 plants or something, it would be very useful for the schools in Solomon Islands and Fiji to have some of these things. And this is Patrick Picacha, who is, he's published about four books now. He booked one on the Wild West, which is about the uh, wildlife and nature of the Western Psalms. He just did another one called uh, Shore to Shore. Beautiful books. Okay. We worked in the Marshall Islands. We did a book on the, in both English and Marshallese on the medicinal plants of the Marshall Islands so that uh, that knowledge is, was not lost. Hanako Term, amazing. She passed away a few years ago, but she, was, she was, had so much knowledge about plants. She had 41 different medicinal plants growing in their own garden in Majuro alone. So what I'm saying is there's, there's a real wealth of things out there. And that's what the book looks like. To give you some ideas, next. Uh, we were asked, uh, myself, Dave Hassel, and Harley Manor, to do a study of the plants of Nauru. We published this for the people of Nauru. Uh, I've already told you about that. Launching of the plant, launching of Marangeti Viti. Undoubtedly, you can contest this, but the most successful environmental NGO, um, uh, local NGO in the whole Pacific is Nature Fiji Marangeti Fiji, which was started by Dick Watling, and uh, which Nunia Thomas, one of our graduates, is a real star now uh, in research, and an expert on that is she's now the director of it. Go back, maybe Nunia is in the picture. No, but, but again, they were planting trees as part of it. The launching of the Great Sea Reef, I think, I'm, did I show you that already? No, I showed you the Great Sea Reef. But there is the Tui Madhuwata, traditional ceremony to make the reef sacred. USP, importance of marine reserves is so important for the recovery of these, of these animals and reefs. Uh, Kambara Limestone, working with Francis Orecki, who's now with uh, I think WWF, but we went there with a team and we did a project to record their, their knowledge and to try to promote marine conservation as well as try to do the sustainable production of, ooh, I deleted the next slide, which is Vesi is their number one wood. That's the wood they use for carving kava bowl. So, oh, there it is. And so the other part of the project was the sustainable trying to maximize the use of each piece of wood and to have a replanting program for this very valuable wood, which is probably the most important carving wood in the Pacific and was used for all the furniture at the Chinese Olympics, probably harvested from Indonesia. But uh, so these are the kind of projects that are innovative. I just want to give you some ideas. Next. And uh, working with Johnny Neokula and, and other people from USP and the National Trust, 
We actually worked with the local people in the Nabua River catchment to document the biodiversity there to get it to be established as the first Ramsar site in Fiji. Working with the Tonga Forestry Department, uh, Shione Fakaosi, who is a student, we, uh, I kept talking about the fact, all these people talk about climate change and everything, I said, well, all you need to do is to, you need to protect your forest and plant your forest. It was at a meeting in Hawaii, and so all of a sudden, the chickens came home to roost. Someone said, well, Randy, can you do it? And I said, well, show us you can do it. So I went there with Sione, we talked to the forest department, talked to local villagers, and this area here was totally eroded. The sea was coming up, it was killing all of the sweet potatoes and crops. You couldn't grow anything there. The house roofs were being corroded by sea spray. This is at Homa, right? Your Homa. So we that's the area, the Homa Reforestation Project. Next. It's along a two kilometer part of the coastline there. And this is what it looks like after we planted it about how many years afterwards, I can't remember, but you can see the green wall along there that, between the forest and then the thing. So this is what it looked like before. On the outside, next. And here you have, we planted a double row staggered of casherina on the front. And then we planted a mixture of something like 90, 98 other species, native species on the inner side of that to form this living wall. You've got the Sago Rehabilitation Scheme, which Isaac, Isaac uh, Rounds did his master's thesis on. And uh, they, he and Dick Watling and those people developed the Sago Recovery Plan. And they also brought in the Pejibaya, or the peach palm, to plant as a plantation crop that people could use for millionaire salad. Because as you know, they sell the heart of the sago palm down along the coast near Navua, near uh, Basket, Niumba, uh, near Navua. And they were cutting down the trees. That was their only source of income. So Dick got this plan, protected it, but he figured, well, we got to have a source of income for them. So this is a, a nice example. Next. Uh, you had Terminalia richii, which is a very fast-growing Samoan tree. So Lex Thompson, who's a wor world expert on plant propagation and selection, they worked with the Samoans to take, so they're using an indigenous tree as part of a silvicultural system. It's a very fast-growing tree. It's related to the uh, tavola here. And then Flugia flexuosa. It's actually native, they used to call it Securi Nega Samoana, but it's actually Flexia Fluigurosa, native to the Solana of the Vanuatu. But the Germans brought it in and were planting it everywhere. It's a major agroforestry tree. Shark Bay, they planted white, white wood logs, major thing. So again, agroforestry. Manongi Paka Uvea. How many of you have been to Uvea? Uvea has the most intact culture of lays, garlands, and making scented coconut oil. And I, I'm not exaggerating. I would say two-thirds of all the people every day wear a garland to work. And they aren't just a regular garland like now you're getting people going to graduation and they got crepe paper garlands and things like that. You know, but these are things made out of plants which are threatened species in Tonga. Hea, hey, 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 the Koli, amazing. Okay, back. Oh, I've already had that slide. Okay, again, just to finish off, I think the culmination of the USD graduation is a heck of a lot more than a graduation. It's people like yourself who are, in most cases, going to be going back to your own island communities and working with your people to try to solve the problems of sustainable development. You are the face of modern science, and they are the face of rationality. Next. And there we got Edgar. Well, and these guys, go back to one. Go back. Edgar one was the valedictorian. He's from Samoa. 
His mom is from Malaysia. His dad is a what? Australian? What? Kiwi. Kiwi, right. But I mean, he was he was the valedictorian and top graduate of the class. This woman in the middle is interesting. Very pretty, huh? She's wearing a garland of Tanya Maldia, the indented flower from Taunyuni. She happens to be from Taunyuni, and her name happens to be Tanya Maldia. So, and these are many of your friends that you know. They're walking the talk. They're, they're doing what we want to do, and, and uh, many of them are working for SPREP and other agencies right now, environment department, but it's pretty exciting. Next. And the final example of mixing modern technology with science, as you guys know, PG, PG wanted, everybody had a British coach, right? And then the next year, I think, Samoa wanted, and they had a, so the, the British invented seven aside rugby, right? Tricking them. So the British have the science, the Fijians have the indigenous knowledge, right? The right combination. Next, Thanks for your patience.